I'm excited about the word God's given me. We're going to start a series. Um, you know, this kind of came out of our men's group, but I felt like it's so important for us as a congregation. The series is called Taming the Tongue. And um, you said, you looked at your spouse and said, this is for you tonight. Um, but that's what we're going to be, I'm going to be preaching on, Jeff and I will be preaching on that, the tongue. You know, most babies say their first word sometime between 12 and 18 months of age. Obviously, some start sooner and some start later. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that it takes about a year or a year and a half to start speaking, but it takes a lifetime to learn how to stop. You know, some people never learn how to stop. Uh, some people never get control of their tongues, and if you brought them with you to church tonight, you elbow them. That's what we, uh, they, my spouse does to me. You know who those people are. <laughs> uh, I won't tell you to say their names. But did you know this, that God's Word has a lot to say about words? Uh, so many scriptures are on speech. Um, and the reason that is, is because there's power when we speak. Our, our words carry power. Solomon said in Proverbs 18 and 21, you know this verse, it says, death and life are in the power of your tongue. It's amazing to me to think that the most dangerous weapon that we own is not a gun, it's not a knife, it's, um, it's not bear spray. You know, bear spray is pretty awesome. It'll spray about 20 feet. Um, but that's not the greatest weapon we have it's a three-inch tongue. That's the greatest weapon you have tonight. It's your tongue. It's three inches long. Some of you have probably got about a 12-inch tongue. Um, but the tongue is a weapon of mass destruction. The tongue can kill things. It can kill families. It can kill marriages. It can kill friendships. It can even kill children. It can kill churches. It can kill ministries. Think of that. It can kill a church. To think that our tongue has the power to bring life or death, it's sobering. And this is the reality, if you'll just let me be honest tonight, this is why I feel led to preach this, is because the people that identify themselves as the people of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God, most of the time, they have no control over their tongue. They're no different than the world. They still battle the tongue. They still cannot get control over the tongue. Um, I've grown up in church long enough to realize that the majority of Christians would rather spread gossip than the gospel. They would rather talk about others than talk about Jesus. They would rather talk about something bad rather than talk about something good. They would rather co criticize than compliment. They would rather argue than agree. And they would rather put someone down instead of picking someone up. And that has to change. That is not the will of God. That's the will of the devil, is for you to bring death to everything by your words, and they can do that. And so if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to control our tongue and discipline ourselves to speak in a way that honors God and people, it's, your, your testimony is going to be a disaster. Jesus said this about your words. You, you will either be justified or condemned by your words. That God keeps a record, listen to this, of every word you speak. And we forget that. Every word we speak will be recorded. Go to James chapter 1 and 26. This is incredible. Uh, it's in your Bible. It says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, notice it says, thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. If you can't bridle the tongue, discipline the tongue, get control over your tongue, James is saying your religion is useless. That faith is not profitable if you cannot control your tongue. The tongue can destroy your Christian testimony. 
Proverbs 13 and 3, it says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. When you go to the doctor, one of the first things that they do, a doctor will do when you get there for examination, they'll tell you to open their mouth and they'll look in your tongue. You ever thought of that? They'll look down your tongue into your throat. It tells a lot about your physical condition. If your tongue is coated, you probably have a fever. If it's yellow, if it's yellowish, um, your digestive system may, out, may be out of sorts. By looking at your tongue, a doctor can tell a lot about your physical condition. But similarly, a tongue, a tongue examination, we learn a lot about a person's spiritual condition as well. Um, this is what a Christian apologist said. He said, by examining the tongue of a patient, physicians find out diseases of the body. Philosophers find out diseases of the mind, and Christians find out the diseases of the soul. You know who the great physician is? It's Jesus. And Jesus can look at your tongue to tell the condition of your heart. From the abundance of your heart, he said, your mouth speaks. He can look in your tongue. Uh, James said we have to bridle the tongue. The reason we have to bridle the tongue is because the tongue is elusive. It's fast. It's, it can get away from us in a hurry. Uh, one of the fastest parts of the human body is, is the brain. Our brains operate at incredible speeds. Um, Harvard Research did a study in speed, uh, speed analysis on the human brain. I'm going to read you what they found. It says, despite the fact that brains have so many more synapses than computers have transistors, the computer is only 100 times slower than the brain by this measure because of the computer's multi-gigahertz processor speed. Our brains operate at incredible speeds, but there's something faster than our brain, and it's our tongue. I'll show you. Our tongues outrun our brain. Have you ever spoke before you thought? Many times. And you thought, oh, that came out. <laughs> and what happens is we speak before we think. And when we do that... Lord, we get ourselves in trouble. We have to bridle the tongue. James said in James 3 and 8, he said, no man can tame the tongue. Think of that. It is an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. Taming, when you think about taming, uh, taming is a process by which a wild beast is subdued into adapting and submitting to human control. You have to submit your tongue. Your tongue is a beast. And when you let it out, it can get away from you, and you can't get it back in there. It just runs wild. And according to Scripture, it's the hardest beast to tame. It's the tongue. So listen, if no man can tame the tongue, who can tame the tongue? The Holy Ghost can tame your tongue. But listen, He will not control what you do not surrender. He will not control what you do not surrender. He won't. You have to surrender your tongue to the Lord. Uh, the Holy Spirit can do that. I was studying, and you know the story about Daniel. He was thrown into the lion's den. What did God do? God shut the mouth of a lion. The Lord said to me, if I can shut a lion's mouth, I can shut your mouth. And God can do that. Many people I've, I've heard that have a problem with their tongue, they say, this is who I am, this is what I've done, I can't control it. You cannot apart from God, but with God, if you believe the Scriptures, you can do all things through Christ Jesus that gives you strength. Amen? You can do that tonight. When I say you have to surrender your tongue, it starts in prayer. Prayer is asking God for help. It's asking God for divine power. It's asking God for his strength. What does it say in the book of Romans? The Spirit of God helps us in our weaknesses. The Spirit of God can help you in your weakness. If, it, if your weakness is your tongue, he can help you there. 
But apart from his strength and his power, you'll never bridle your tongue. Psalm 141, 1 through 3. I want to read this and I'm going to, be, I'm going to go slow through it. This is David. He said, Lord, I cry out to you. This is prayer. He said, make haste to me. Give ear to the voice to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the, the lifting up of my hands as evening sacrifice. Verse 3. He's crying out to God, asking God for his help. Make haste to me, Lord. And this is what he says. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. This is a man after God's own heart. You can love God. You can love church. You can be in the Bible. You can be uh, serving in ministry and still have trouble with your mouth. I saw a meme on Facebook. Can I be funny for a minute? Somebody said, you speak in tongues, but you gossip in English. <laughs> you ever seen that cat meme with that girl? It's that cat and that girl. And um, I thought that was amazing. Uh, <laughs> but he said, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. I want you to think about this for a second. What does a guard do? A guard keeps bad people from getting out of prison. And when David is saying, set a guard, O Lord, over my lips, what he's saying is, I need a guard to be here so that bad things don't get out. And when they do get out, that guard will chase them down and bring them back into prison. And so tonight, if your words are criminal, <laughs> if they're bad, you ought to say, Lord, set a guard over my lips that when bad things begin to come out, that you'll go run them down and tackle them and get them back in prison. Keep a door, he said, over my, my lips. What a word picture. You know, every now and then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to guard our mouth. When we start to speak things that we shouldn't, and listen to me right now, I've been there. <laughs> My wife's not here. She'd tell you. She'd tattle on me. She'd say, you're a preacher. She does that to me. When I start being mean, she'll say, you're a preacher. You're a preacher. And that shuts me up so fast. It does. I'm learning. But listen to me. When you begin, you know when you get yourself hot and you start saying things, the Spirit of God starts to convict you. And you can ignore Him or you can obey Him. Our tongue, when it gets out of control, we need the correction of the Holy Spirit to say, get back in there and shut your mouth. Psalm 19 and 14, this is what David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, I prayed this so many years. I'm going to be vulnerable tonight because I want to help you. When I first got married, my wife and I, like many of you, we argued a lot. It was her fault, too. And we argued a lot, and, th and it bothered me. And many times I would fail, and I would make mistakes, and I'd say things I shouldn't, and I'd let my mouth get away from my brain. And I read this verse, and I prayed it for years. I'd wake up in the morning, I was desperate. I said, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I knew this, that if my words would be acceptable in the sight of God, and if my words would be acceptable in his hearing, they would be okay for everybody else. If I could please God with the fruit of my lips, everything else would be okay. And like the psalmist, and you say, well, you're a preacher, you, you're, no, no. We struggle in many things. James said this, we stumble in many things. If no one stumbles in tongue, they're a perfect man. And so this was my prayer. I memorized this. I quoted it. I would do it every day for years. And I'll tell you right now, there's hope for you tonight because the Lord has helped me so much in this and it's restored my marriage. It's made my home life so much better. By, because there's death and life and the power of your words, of your tongue. Um, Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time to keep silence and there's a time to speak. 
And a part of that bridling of the tongue, it's discernment to know when to shut it down and when to speak. There, there ha you have to have that balance. There's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. Today in our world, everybody wants to speak. Everybody wants a microphone. Everybody wants a podcast. Everybody wants to speak and give input and opinion all the time. And it's not necessary. For the Christian, it's not necessary. There has to be a time where we say, I've got to be silent and I've got to be quiet. It's okay not to give your opinion. It's okay not to give your input. It's okay not to have the answer to every solution. There's a time to keep silent and there's a, there's a time to speak. God has great things to say about people who limit their words. Proverbs 17 and 27. This is what he said. He who has knowledge spares his words. And a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. When you have an understanding and you have um, self-control, you can spare your words. I love what verse 28 says. You're, you're going to laugh at this, but it's in your Bible. It says, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. Even a fool, when they keep their mouth shut, they're counted as wise. It says, when he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. So why is it so important to hold our tongue? I'll show you. Go to Proverbs chapter 10. Go there in your Bible. You got to get it. Proverbs 10, or write this down, Proverbs 10 and verse 19. This is what it says. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. Wow. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. What's he saying? The more you talk, the more likely you are to sin. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. So I'm going to give you a few things right here, and I'm done, about how you can tame your tongue. That's how you can do it. Number one, it's recognition of our inability to do it apart from God's help. You know what I believe our God is pleased with? Is when you ask Him for help. When you ask the Lord for help, He'll help you. But you have to ask Him for help. You have to recognize. The Spirit of God will give, you, will give you the ability to recognize the error of your ways. So recognize your inability to do it apart from God's help and that you need His intervention. And listen to me. You specifically ask God to help you. If it's a person, if it's your spouse, if it's a coworker, if it's whoever, you pray and ask God to give you control over your tongue with that person. Maybe you, don't, you can control your tongue, but this person comes in and it's like, man, you just let it go. <laughs> Ask the Lord to help you specifically in that area. Another thing that you have to do is you have to familiarize yourself and study Scripture on what God says about words. You know, listen, your willpower and your self-esteem is not enough. You need God's power. What is God's power? God's power is in His Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. It's profitable. But if you don't know the Word of God and what the Word of God says about your words, you're not going to be able to have victory over it. I'll tell you this, and I feel like we're in kindergarten, but it's okay. When you say something... Ask yourself these three things. Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Is this helping y'all tonight? Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And when you do not, when you stumble here, the best thing you can do, I, and this, is, this takes humility, now, the reason why a lot of us can't get control over things in our life is because we have pride operating and we're afraid to say, I'm sorry. We're afraid to repent and apologize. But if you'll catch yourself in the middle of a heated argument or you're gossiping or whatever, 
and you stop and you say, Lord, I'm sorry, and you apologize to that person, eventually that'll break. It'll break. Immediately apologize to the person and mean it and mean it. You say, well, I don't want to apologize. They're wrong. It's their fault. They're the reason I said what I said. Okay, let me tell you something. When you come to the house of God and you've not uh, restored fellowship with that person, you're not going to have right fellowship with God in worship. If your brother is offended at you, if you've sinned against them, what does it say? If you come to the altar to bring your gift and you remember, look, it's in the scripture, you remember that somebody has something against you, what does it say? Leave your gift at the altar and first be reconciled to your brother, then come back and offer your gift. You know what keeps us from being able to really have a, uh, a direct uh, current of power with God? It's our, ver it's our horizontal relationships. When you treat people like <laughs> crap and you think you're just going to come into the presence of God and worship and everything's going to be hunky-dory, it's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. I'll tell you a story. I'll never forget this. I'm being vulnerable tonight. Um, I was at a church in, in Whitfield. I told y'all this story. I always know God's going to do something when there's going to be hostility on Saturday. I know that. I've learned that. The enemy wants to get me at enmity with my spouse before I have to come up here and minister. Happens all the time. I'm on guard about it. I finally, I'm not unwise to his devices anymore. Um, but I'll never forget this. Megan and I, have you ever been, be real tonight, have you ever been on your way to church and had a, a, <laughs> a bad argument? <laughs> have you ever done that? Being honest, you just had it out. Lord, we, when we used to head to church growing up as kids, it was war <laughs> in the van, <laughs> the, the purple van. It was, it was a war zone. And, um, but listen, this is what I learned. Before we got in church, we all had to apologize to each other. So we would receive what we needed to from the Lord. But back to my story about preaching, I was preaching at this church in Withill. We're in the middle of worship. Worship is really where I connect with God. It's really where I enter into the presence of the Lord. There's a lot of times I did tonight, I'll be in worship and I'll just be crying my eyes out. And we got into worship, the music was great, and I felt off, really off. And the Lord told me, he said, don't you dare go to that pulpit without apologizing to your spouse. And I sat Megan down, it's a true story, I sat her down, and it was both of us, just at each other. And I said, I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me for what I said. And she asked me to forgive her too. And it, we had such a powerful service that day. And so listen to me. If you do not want to quench the Spirit of God in your, in your spiritual life, ask the Lord to help you with your tongue. It will change it. It will change your spiritual dynamic tremendously. The last thing that I'll, I'll give you is this. If you're really having trouble with your words, with taming your tongue, get accountability in your life. Have some accountability in your life. Get somebody that you love, respect, somebody that can speak into your life and go to them and say, pray for me over this area. That's how you get victory. This is what the Bible says. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. What's it saying? Confess your faults to somebody and have them pray for you. That's how you break that yoke of bondage off of your life. Taming the tongue. I'm going to pray for us and... Um, I want you just to, to reverently, if, if this is you tonight and this is for you, I'm not going to have you come forward, but I want you to um, ask the Lord to give you strength as I pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we come before you, God, and all of us, all of us, like James said, we all stumble in many things. And he said that if we don't stumble in word, we are a perfect man. And Lord, I know this, I am not perfect. And I believe tonight many would say, I, am, I stumble in many things and I stumble with my words. I stumble with my tongue. My tongue has not been a source of life. It has been a source of death. And tonight, I want victory. Tonight, I want the Holy Spirit to give me power over my words. That my words can be a fountain of life. My words can be a, a fruit that's pleasing to the Lord. And Lord God, I, I pray that tonight, our church, I talked about how it's amazing to me that people would rather spread gossip than the gospel. That people would rather argue than agree. Than all those things. Lord, would it be said of this church and this body that, Lord, we honor you with our words. We honor you with what comes out of our mouth. And, Father, I pray tonight, because I believe many people will um, repent and apologize I pray, God, that there would be healing and restoration in the lives of people, God. Lord, we love you tonight. We worship you, and we give you praise. And everyone said, amen.